again. Here. Hey guys and girls. This is Gordon Overkill today with a Friday evening stream. And the purpose of this stream is to give you guys and especially those uh, Adom fans among uh, the, the viewers of the stream a little introduction to Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, which is together with Adom one of my very favorite games and also a fantastic little gem of a roguelike. I explained on previous streaks. Um, compared to Adom, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup is more of a competitive game. I don't roleplay it just as much as I roleplay Adom. I rather try to play it a bit more effectively, go for, uh, for high placements in the annual tournament, uh, winning streaks and uh, challenging combinations of races and classes which I also enjoy very, very much. Yeah, just uh, for the start. Hi, Eldritch Wolfie. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, just uh, for the start, I am actually a pretty decent player in this game. I uh, finished in the tournament in um, top 20 and top 30 positions multiple times. And uh, I won, I think, 260 games uh, all together with uh, all races and all classes. So I've got a rough idea how to play the game. And I hope that my hints are not totally bad. Yeah, what do you see here? I am on the website underhound.eu. Underhound EU is one of the servers on which you can play Dungeon Cross Stone Soup online. Oh, Eldritch Wolfie. You bought the vinyl. Oh, that's totally nice. Uh, thanks a lot for the support. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, which vinyl? The, the Messerschmitt vinyl or the Atom Smasher vinyl? Because they both were released pretty much on almost the same day. Uh, Atom Smasher, ah, okay. Atom Smasher, by the way, for those who don't know, um, next to gaming and uh, sports, my third big hobby is uh, music. And uh, especially I'm a very, very big fan of uh, hard rocking and heavy metal music. And I uh, play in two bands at the moment. Uh, in Atom Smasher, it's a traditional heavy metal band. Uh, maybe if I want to compare it to big bands, it has a bit of a feeling like Iron Maiden. Not the same technical level, of course. In that band, I play the guitars and I sing. And uh, the other band is called Messerschmitt. It's a traditional speed metal band, a bit like Megadeth Metallica for big bands to compare it with, where I play the bass. Uh, if that's possible, of course I would do that. Uh, just by the way, how far would I have to travel from Germany? <laughs> Eldritch Wolfie uh, was asking for me to come along and sign the vinyl. <laughs> in Holland? Oh, in Holland, that's actually not a... That might even be possible. Because uh, just, uh, by the way, without uh, telling too much, which is not yet official, I uh, have got a third band project and we will record a single for that project this year. And uh, we will record the single in a studio in Holland. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I talked with the producer. So uh, it, it is at the west coast of Holland. So I will definitely be in the area. And yeah, like I said, maybe it's even possible. This was a funny idea at first, but uh, let's, uh, let's keep that in mind. It, it might even be possible. <laughs> But for now, this is not the heavy metal stream. It's the dungeon crawl stone soup stream. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, um, what I was just telling, um, this is one of the many dungeon crawl stone soup servers on which you can play the game online. And my idea for today was everybody who would like to uh, maybe get a little kickstart towards the first crawl winner 
is welcome and invited to play the game along with me on one of these servers. There are multiple servers all over the world and it makes sense to pick the one that is closest to your home base so you've got the best possible performance. Underhound is, uh, I think the server is, uh, where exactly is it? Uh, at least close to Germany. I don't think it's in Germany, but was it in France or maybe even in Holland? I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. But um, yeah, that's the goal for today. I will play a beginner, beginner friendly character, pretty easy combination. Maybe the, 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 the archetype of the Minotaur fighter or Minotaur berserker or something like that, for those who don't know the game yet. And I will play the game in small parts. I think uh, it makes sense to divide the game in certain parts and uh, try to successfully uh, reach these parts uh, consistently. If you get there, um, you can... Um, you can step by step and piece by piece increase your skill to a level where you can reliably beat the game. Those uh, steps are step one, reach the ecumenical temple. Step two, reach the entrance to the Lair of Beasts. Step three, clear the levels of the Lair of Beasts, maybe the first five or even the first six. Then back to the dungeon and clear the remaining dungeon levels. Afterwards, clear the Orcish Mines. Then we come to the point where we already reached the mid game, where we go for our first two runes, one or two runes, depending on how the game goes. Next step, clear the first four level of the vaults and probably also the depths. Afterwards, next step, get the third rune and then dive down the realm of Zot and finish the game. These are the steps that I want to um, guide you through. <laughs> So, the question is, what kind of a character do we want to play today? Before we do that though, I think there are certain versions of the game you can play on the server. The most interesting version is the one with the highest number. That's the current stable version, 0.26. The 0.26 tournament was just a couple uh, weeks and months ago. And the trunk version. The trunk version is not yet a stable version, but uh, it's the version where where um, where the developers experiment with uh, certain changes they might want to implement into the game. I personally prefer to play the trunk version between the tournaments, so I'm always up to date with recent changes. And I uh, play the stable version. Uh, Mostly just in the tournament. Mostly just in the tournament. There is always a tournament right when a new stable version is released. Next to these versions you can play, you find the edit RC file. The RC file is your personal uh, um, specific file and I made a couple changes to that. I could probably explain that quickly. Um, this one is very important. I force the more message for certain enemies that might appear in the game. So whenever one of these enemies appears in my game, I have to press spacebar in order to uh, let the game continue. So I don't accidentally run into them when I play quickly in a speedrun or something like that. That's ghosts, fiends, hellions, liches, tormentors, doom hounds. All of these enemies are very dangerous in a different way. So it might make sense to get an extra warning when they come into your line of sight. Like Cats and Adam? Uh, if you can kill the enemy, it's always a good idea to do that. Stone oozes, oh my god, oh my god, stone oozes. I'm still not past that episode. I, uh, I think of it a lot. <laughs> well, there are there is nothing like cats in Adam in this game, but there are some enemies that can kill you in a single turn, just like the stone ooze did to our our poor heroine at the beginning of the week. Take a look at the other things. What do I have also? I have manual training set to true, so I don't have to uh, actively set it to manual each time I start a game. 
auto fight stop at 80 there is an auto fight function in the game that usually makes you fight until you're down to 40 percent of your hp that's a little too low for my taste so i stop auto fight when i go down to 80 percent of my hp all other more messages there are certain other more messages in the game i set them to false so you can play a little quicker Tile mouse control, I set that to false, so I don't accidentally click on the map and step on a square where I don't want to step and then die. Um, I think that's the most important. Yeah, Warn hatch is true, so I don't accidentally take a hatch rather than a staircase. And I get an extra HP warning when I'm at 65% of my HP. That's pretty much the most important uh, changes that I made to my RC file. So, let's go into the game. I play the game in the trunk version. Like I said, the experimental version, not totally stable, but in my eyes absolutely stable enough. The question is what kind of an of a character do we want to play? Um the easiest races in my eyes and the most beginner-friendly and straightforward races are the hill orc, the minotaur, the gargoyle, the troll, Nah, troll is um, probably the mid game is a bit tougher, but still, a troll has a very strong early game, so you can play it. And the deep dwarf. I think I would rather not play troll or deep deep dwarf today because they have some special mechanics and or special ways of progressing through the game. The hill orc, the minotaur, and the gargoyle are pretty straightforward. Of these three. The Minotaur is the strongest in the very early game, so if you are worried about dying on the first levels, the Minotaur is your choice. The reason is this, the Minotaur has some horns. As an auxiliary attack he uses them and they help you very much against the enemies on the first levels. The Hillock doesn't have these horns, but he gets a little stronger later, because he can wear a helmet while the Minotaur can just wear a hat. Both of them have amazing aptitudes for melee fighting and physical attributes. Both of them also have pretty high hit points, which is a big advantage too. The gargoyle, on the other hand, is a bit weaker in the very early game due to the fact that he has pretty low hit points. So especially on the first levels, many enemies can probably one-shot you if you don't judge the danger correctly. Therefore, the gargoyle starts with a couple of amazing resistances. He is immune to poison, he is resistant to electricity. Both are serious threats in the early and in the mid game. Also, the gargoyle progressively gets harder and harder skin as he levels up, so he is guaranteed to have very high armor class in the late game, which makes up for his lack of hit, of hit points. So the gargoyle is the one for those who get through the very early game pretty reliably and want to have more of a boost for the mid game and especially for the late game. I think for a total beginner that's not what you should be worrying about now. Although it's probably a bit boring and everybody who knows crawl knows this combination too, I'd say let's take the minotaur. The minotaur the best for the very early game. Afterwards, we choose a background for our character. There are some miscellaneous backgrounds, Artificer, Wanderer and Delver. Don't care about these now. There are Zealot backgrounds. Zealot means that you already start with a deity. The Berserker starts as a follower of Trok, the god of wrath and berserking rage. The Abyssal Knight starts as a follower of Lugano, the god of the Abyss. Pretty strong god, but nah, we don't do that on our character. We go more straightforward. And the Chaos Knight is a follower of Zom. That's a special challenge class that you should not be thinking about at the moment. Then we have some warrior mages, Transmuter, Warper, Arcane, Marksman and Enchanter, who are a bit of a um, hybrid uh, playstyle. And we have the pure mages. Pure mages don't worry about them now. There's a very big uh, selection of spells and uh, it is science by itself to know which spells you need for which part of the game, which spells synergize and which don't. So the mages, no, better, better care about the mages later once you learn the basics of positioning, the strengths and weaknesses of the monsters and so on. 
So, which uh, backgrounds do I recommend for beginners? Fighter, Gladiator, Berserker. Gladiator has the advantage he starts with throwing nets, which is actually pretty helpful against a couple of serious early game threats, like for example Ogres. The disadvantage is the Gladiator starts with a little, yeah, with a pretty, pretty, pretty weak armor. He, he has just got a leather armor, and that's not what you want. You want a little more armor class if you can get it. The Berserker also has very light armor, but being a follower of Troc gives him some amazing divine abilities that he can use from the very first turn on. That's what makes the Berserker very, very strong and probably the most recommendable class for beginners. Also, since you already start with a very strong and straightforward god, which is Trog, you don't have to worry about the whole pantheon of Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup for the moment. The fighter finally has a very strong armor and he also starts with the shield, which is a good advantage. But I think once again we go for the strongest possible, uh, possible class for the very early game, which is the Berserker. We play a Minotaur Berserker. There are six different weapon kinds in Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. Short swords, maces, hand axes, spears, falcons, yeah, falcon, that's uh, pretty much uh, long blades and unarmed combat. Short swords, short blades, that's daggers and short swords and rapiers. They have a bonus for stabbing and they have pretty quick attack. Also, you don't have to train the skill very high to use it at max maximum efficiency. Maces have probably the highest 1v1 damage and you don't have to train them quite as high to use the best one-handed variations of them. Hand axes, little less damage than mages, but they have the advantage that they are a bit more forgiving for bad positioning because they cleave all around you. If you use a hand axe, you don't just attack the monster that you directly attack, but you also do a little weaker attack against everybody who stands adjacent to you. Spears have increased range. You can increase the enemy from one tile distance. Very helpful too on many characters. That's the strongest weapon you can take. Long blades give you a passive attack whenever you dodge an enemy's attack. Then you retaliate and get extra damage in. Also pretty nice. Unarmed combat finally is very strong in this game. If you get that up to a high level and you play a character who gets probably a bonus damage like a ghoul or a troll, this will be pretty much the strongest way of fighting in the late game. You are pretty weak early with Anan Combat, so, so that's not an option for us. There are two-handed variations of all the weapon classes except for the short sword and for unarmed fighting. The problem is two-handed weapons require you to play a lot more carefully because you cannot use a shield, you are more vulnerable to ranged attacks. And well, I'd say the damage of the one-handed weapons is enough to win the game. You can, of course, slaughter your enemies in no time with a two-handed weapon. It can be very, very effective, but you need to be very good at positioning so you don't get uh, surrounded by your enemies. Ideally, you fight them in small groups or 1v1. So I think that's more of an advanced strategy if you do not find a very good two-handed weapon early on. Hi, Pantutini. Welcome to the stream. Nice to see you. <laughs> So, I would say we go for the most forgiving weapon, which is the hand axe. So if you make uh, mistakes in your positioning, you end up in the middle of all your enemies, you still have the best chance of getting out of there. And we will try to train a one-handed hand axe. Here is our character. A Minotaur Berserker of Chuck wielding a hand axe. Hi, Curvox. Welcome to the stream. <coughs> We are standing right on top of this little square here. I can show it to you. It is the stairway leading out of the dungeon. 
Because just like in Adom, it's not just about re reaching the bottom and uh, killing all the bosses. You also have to get back out afterwards, which can be super interesting and super exciting. It's called the Orb Run and I have, oh my god, I had some exciting Orb Runs since I played this game. Apart from that, the first thing you want to do whenever you start the game is press the M button. M brings you to the list of your skills. And here, since I already told you, I set that to manual training mode automatically. If that's not the case, you have to swap to manual. And then you have to uh, decide what you want to train. For our Minotaur Berserker, stealth doesn't matter. We want heavy armor. We will not be stealthy anyways. Spell casting doesn't matter. We will never cast a single spell with this character. Fighting. Fighting is important. Fighting increases the character's hit points and also gives a slight bonus to your damage. More hit points are always very, 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 very helpful, so we want that. Axis is the skill we use to uh, get better at our main uh, weapon. We want that too, but we do not want that infinitely. We are starting with a hand axe. The axis skill does not only give you damage, but it also decreases the minimum delay of uh, you swimming, swinging that weapon. And you want to have the minimum delay as quickly as possible. For a hand axe, that's skill level 14. Once you have skill level 14, you will attack as quickly as possible with this hand axe. Later on, we want to get it up to 20 because that's the min delay for the broad axe, the strongest one-handed axe in the game. Armor and dodging will become important, but probably not right now as we start. It's more important to get our hit points up and our extra skill to a decent level. We don't, don't have heavy armor anyway, so that doesn't matter at the moment. So let's press F twice and G twice. So these are not trained anymore. Let's maybe start by getting our fighting up to 10. You do that by pressing the equal button and then the letter of the, of the talent. So equal A. Let's uh, set a target skill level for fighting, that's 10. And our target skill level for access is 14. Since we want to get to this min delay level in access as quickly as possible, we press the C button one more time. So we have the star rather than the plus sign. That means that now 66% of our experience gets into access, while 33% gets into fighting. That's how we start the game for our skills. You liked the Adom streams, uh, Pantotini, since you have been wasting too many hours in the past 20 years <laughs> on Adom. <laughs> uh, honestly, we probably all have, probably all of us have wasted uh, endless hours on this game. <laughs> so that was the first thing. Let me explain what you see on the user interface. Here we can read we are a Minotaur, but we are a Minotaur of Troc. I already said, Trok is the god of rage and uh, berserking. And this little star up here means that we already have one dot of piety starting the game. That means we can ask our god Trok for a favor. How do we do that? We press the A button. If we press A, we get to our abilities. Here we have two choices. We can either renounce our religion if we don't want to follow Trok anymore. That would be a bad idea because he would uh, cast his vengeance upon us. Or we could Berserk. Berserk is the early level bread and butter of the Berserker. It's the, the main reason why the Berserker is such a strong class. I will show that to you later. But since it's a little too annoying for us to press AA every time we want to Berserk, it's not that difficult actually, but we don't want to do that, I show you how to create a macro. You press Control D. Control D opens this little menu down here. Now we press M for macros. And we decide which macro we need for our Berserk ability. And I always put Berserk on the letter one. Usually I have one, two, three, four for my basic uh, spells or abilities. And I have F1, F2, F3, F4 for additional skills like summonings or big nuke spells. And I have F5, F6, F7 for buffs for the character. So that's usually the, the macros that I use. Um, we will redefine our one button. With R, I can redefine it if it already had another uh, macro on it. It is AA, so I usually don't have, don't have to do that, but I will show it to you. Redefine, and we input the macro AA. 
We press Control D again and S for save. So now this macro is saved even if we leave the game and get back afterwards. So now all I have to do to Berserk is to press the one button. It's super handy on all characters, especially on spellcasters. If you can macro the spells, that makes the game a thousand times more, co more comfortable to play. Hey, meandering cat. Ah, you didn't miss a lot. Uh, we just, we didn't move a single step so far. I just explained the basics of the game, where you find the servers, which character class we play, why we play it. And now I'm just explaining the basic functions of the game. We uh, already went through the, the skills, which skills you should train and why you should train them and how far you should train them. Now I explained how to use your holy abilities and special abilities. Yeah, that's our piety for now. We have 19 health points. That's not bad for level one. Still, it's pretty low. There are certain enemies in the early game that can burst you down pretty quickly. If we encounter one of them, I will tell you about it. We have zero magic points. That's the Berserker. He's not a very magical guy. AC. How long does one run in this game take? In the last tournament, my fastest run was one and a half hours. I'm not a fast player and I didn't play a real-time speedrun. That's a pretty quick game. The real-time world record is on somewhere around 20 minutes. I think an average run if you uh, don't really rush it, should be between two and a half and three and a half hours, something like that. On the other hand, if you want to win a really challenging combination, I played, for example, a halfling, a hearthling archer in the tournament, which took me 12 and a half, no, 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 I think almost eight hours to win. That was a really long and painful game. I might upload that on the YouTube channel <laughs> later. But usually, uh, you can finish such a game in uh, in one session. That's one of the things I really like about Crawl. In Adom, I absolutely cannot do that. In Adom run, I have no clue. I have no clue. I uh, usually play my Adom runs over several days and many, many hours. It's, it's a lot longer. A whole lot longer, definitely. So if I just want to play uh, one run, I feel like playing uh, a roguelike on one evening and I want to get it to an end, Crawl is my game of choice. Let's take a look of, at the stats up here in the uh, user interface. AC is the armor class. We have just armor class two. That's not good. Adom is RNG. No, 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 no. <laughs> For a good Adom player, it's just as little RNG as Crawl. I also streaked wins in Adom. It's, it's absolutely possible. It's just a matter of uh, how well you rate the situations you get into. The reason why I lost my last Adom runs is because my skills got too rusty. I forgot about important things and that's why I died. It was not the RNG killing me. Ah, you think the speed depends on the RNG. To a certain degree, that's, that's definitely true. You are right. One game can take a lot longer than another one. So, what did I want to explain? Armor class. Just like in Adom, you want to get that up. But not by all means. I will show you when we find an armor. EV is evasion. Makes you dodge, just like defense value in Adom. Below a week, uh, I think I also finished Adam runs in a single day, but um, that's more of an eight hour day than <laughs> SH is shields. We don't have a shield yet. We will get one later. The basic uh, statistics is strength, intelligence, dexterity. Intelligence you need for spell casting, dexterity you need for dodging and uh, to increase your hit chance. Strength gives you damage and it enables you to wear heavy armor without penalty. For our Minotaur. Strength is by far the most important. Intelligence 4 is super duper stupid. He is not especially a brain cow. <laughs> but well, usually that's not a problem. The only thing is there are certain enemies who can drain your stats. And once the stats goes to the negative, you get serious penalties. For example, if your intelligence goes to zero or below, you are brainless. That means you have a very low chance of reading scrolls or casting spells. 
Also, you cannot move all that fast. It's really, really bad. You don't want that to happen. That's why sometimes I actually increased intelligence a little bit later on with my Minotaurs, just so the risk of getting brainless gets a little less. XL is the experience level, and here we see the percentage how far we got towards the next level. Noise plays an important role in the game. If you make a lot of noise, enemies from nearby rooms will hear you and join the fight. Might be a problem. And time tells us how many time units passed and how many uh, time units our last action took. Time units is not the same as turn. There are, there are certain uh, actions that cost more than one time unit. And there are certain that cost less than one time unit. We will see that later. So we're almost done with the preparation. Let's also take a look at our inventory. We have got a hand axe and an animal skin. Take a look at our hand axe. Here it is. Just uh, so you see how these weapons work. Each weapon, each weapon has a base accuracy. The hand axe accuracy is pretty good, plus three. They have a base damage, seven for the hand axe. These uh, values get modified. The bad damage, for example, gets modified by our weapon skill and by our strength. And it has a base attack delay. Hey, Nostra Dumbass. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. The base delay is how many time units it takes to strike with this weapon without training the weapon at all. So with zero skill level in uh, access, it takes us 1.3 time units to attack once. That means a monster with an attack speed of 1.0 is probably able to strike us twice every third turn when we get just a single attack in. That's very, very dangerous, especially high damage monsters. You don't want to give them extra attacks. You want it the other way around. You want the free attacks. In order to um, reduce the delay of the weapon, we have to increase our access skill. The minimum delay of this weapon is 0.6. But to get this 0.6, Attack speed, we have to get our skill up to 14. That's why we are training our access skill to 14 to start with. And as you can already guess, that means that we are attacking more than twice as fast as we attack in the beginning. So double damage just by attacking faster. That's super, super helpful. I think that's the most important things you need to know about the weapons. You can enchant the weapons later to a maximum of plus nine. The rest is not so important. That's everything we want to know. We can take a look at our character overview. We get there by pressing shift and oh, shift five. Shift five together, so the percent uh, button gets us here. Here we've got everything together on, uh, on one page. Number of turns we played, time we played. And here come a couple of very important intrinsics. That's the resistances, fire resistance, Cold resistance, resistance to negative energy, poison resistance, electricity resistance, corrosion resistance, willpower, and then finally down here are our stealth skill. We have a little stealth because we are wearing very light armor, but we will not have any stealth available in the long term. Willpower protects you from attempts to control your character, confusion, paralyzation, stuff like that. There are certain enemies who can completely mess up your character in a single turn if you don't have the willpower to resist their attacks. Three willpower is the minimum I want to have in order to finish the game. So at one point we want to get to at least three willpower. That's no problem for a follower of Trok though, because Trok later on gives you a holy ability that gives you two bonus picks in willpower. So that will not be a problem. Couple of willpower picks you also get just by leveling up. Corrosion resistance, very situational. There are certain enemies which can corrode you. If you get corroded, your damage and your armor class get reduced. There are certain locations where you have need corrosion resistance, but usually I think most of my characters don't have it at all. Probably the least important resistance. Electricity resistance. There are not that many enemies with electricity damage, but the few who are there are damn dangerous. Hi, Robotskis, welcome to the stream. That's why at one point you absolutely want to get electricity resistance for the mid game in certain locations. And at least for the late game, you need electricity resistance. Not all the time, but you may you need to get it when you need it. You can get it with the resistance potions, with swapping items or anything like that. And I think that's resistance you absolutely want to have. 
poison resistance, super important for the early and mid game. There are poisonous enemies who can completely kill you. If you get poisoned and you don't have a curing potion and you don't have poison resistance, can absolutely ruin your game. It will get less important later on, but in the early and mid game, poison is a big threat. Resist negative energy? Nah, hmm. Situational, a little bit. That's the other one you can probably uh, get along with without. Uh, that's usually if you fight against undead enemies who have a certain way to, 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 to drain you or something like that, then uh, resist negativity helps. Fire and cold resistance, very important. Especially the first pick in these resistances drastically reduces the damage you take from these elements. We will definitely meet enemies who use these damage types and probably also environments who uh, challenge these damage types. And we need these resistances at one point. Probably not in the early game, but we need them in the mid game and in the late game. Here we have C invisibility. Pretty much self-explanatory. We have faith. If we have the faith trait, we will get piety more quickly. Spirit means spirit shield if we have that. Our magic points will be used as additional health points. Reflect, pretty much the literal meaning, so uh, projectiles can be reflected at a certain chance. Harm increases the damage you do as well as the damage you take. I think that's completely useless. I never want to have that. And Rampage means you get a speed bonus when rushing towards your enemies. Very handy. Here we see how quickly we regenerate our HP and our MP. That's pretty much it. Is there anything else I want to show you? Control O. Control O is the last uh, statistic that's important. Here we see all the dungeon levels we already saw, as well as some features that we will find on these dungeon levels, the altars we found and so on. So huh, we are just half an hour in the stream and we can finally start playing the game. Which buttons are important for our character? We walk around with um, with a, with a numpad. We have uh, the macro that we created for our holy ability. Apart from that, some very important buttons are O and tap. O is the button for auto explore. I will press it once you see it. I press O. The character runs through the dungeon. We can see here where he went along, and he will stop as soon as he uh, finds an enemy. The first enemy that this O button brought us to is this rat. A rat is not important. We don't have to take special measures to kill this rat. I will though tell you one very important thing. The situation where you find is extremely important in this game. Um, if I would now run towards the rat and start the fight, it is possible that there are more monsters within the, the fog of war. Those monsters would join the fight and uh, turn this easy 1v1 probably into a tougher 1v2 or 1v3 fight. We don't want that. Also, if we fight here, even if we don't see any monsters, fighting creates noise. So monsters that are close by in the fog of war might get attracted and come and attack us. The Berserk ability uses piety, but just very little. You can pretty much spam it, but you should not always do it. I will show you why. We play that absolutely correctly now. We retreat back into the corridor and wait for the rat to follow us. This is a secured area. We know no more enemies are here. We wait for the rat. And now, although it's not necessary, let's use our berserk ability. I press the one button, so we berserk. The screen turns red. Yep. A film, uh, a red film seems to cover your vision as you go berserk. You feel yourself moving faster. You feel mighty. That's the main advantage of uh, We get an HP boost. See, we have 28 HP now instead of 19. Uh, we got a strength increase. Uh, so we do more damage. And we can now attack very fast. If we attack this uh, red, you see, the attack took just 0.7 turns. That's because we are so super hasted at the moment. The red absolutely explodes. It's not necessary to berserk against the red. But it has also got disadvantages. I will show you. We will retreat a couple turns until we stop berserking. And now we've got minus berserk and slow. That means we are unable to evoke the ability again for a couple of turns. 
and we are slowed down. Now we try to run away from an enemy. You see, it takes us 1.5 time units to move now. So if our Berserk Rage ends too quickly, we are in a very bad situation. We cannot use it again and we can also not run away from the enemies. Also keep in mind, the bonus HP instantly disappear once the rage is over. So we might end up with low HP, slowed and without able to Berserk again. That's uh, definitely a risk. So play it clean. Choose your fights, choose the place where you fight. Very important. Um, talking about the duration of Berserk, you can increase the duration up to a certain level by killing enemies. Because that uh, makes you rage even harder and even faster. Well, we don't want these debuffs to be on our character, so I press the 5 button. That button makes us wait on a single square for a couple of turns until our debuffs change or also until we are fully regenerated. That's also the button 5 which you use to regenerate. So, we go back around uh, the corner. I don't use the auto explore function now, rather I use shift and the directional keys. That means, the same as the walk command in Adam, we walk until we either reach a crossing or until something interesting gets into our view. So we uh, quickly scout around here. To play the game perfectly, we want to um, explore in concentric circles around the square where we s that we have already secured. So I do not want to go through the whole level in a whole long, uh, whole long beeline. Because otherwise, if we are if if we are unlucky uh, from from below, another monster cuts off our retreat route. Here is a goblin, also very easy enemy. We will kill him. Let's wait for the goblin, lure him into safe territory again. That's not necessary usually. A berserker is so strong; it's not necessary. But I just told you how to play how to play the game, ideally. This position has another advantage over um, other positions, and I show you why. I give. Th Oh no, we killed him with our horns. I wanted to give him the chance to hit us. We do that later, then I'll show you. <laughs> no respawns in the game. There are just two locations in the game who have respawns, which is the Abyss and the Pandemonium. But we will hopefully not see any of them in this ordinary game. So I wanted to give the uh, goblin a chance to hit us, but the goblin... Uh, uh, attacked us and um, being a minotaur, I press capital A to show you, we have a pair of horns on our head. And these horns give us a retaliation attack whenever we are attacked. And the horns just killed the goblin. You reflexively headbutt those who attack you in melee. That's what just happened to the, go to the goblin. That's the reason why minotaurs are so strong in the early game. Even stronger than hillocks. Let's see if we can fight another enemy who will probably be able to hit us. Okay, on the ground, we found our first items. This is a pile of stones. We pick them up. Stones are a useful melee weapon. They're rather strong, but they enable you to do a little bit of damage to your enemies and soften them up before they reach melee range. Missile weapon. I think so too, Eldritch Wolfie. Uh, but up to this point, Every character, every minotaur will have to um, take the hat that he gets. And here we have a scroll. The scroll is labeled Amehu Soxefa. As you can guess, that's not what this scroll is actually called. It is just unidentified. You could read the scroll now and um, thus identify it by using it, but it will also waste the scroll and we don't want to waste it. On the first dungeon level, I never read scrolls. We will get the scrolls later. At the moment, we just pick them up. Let's continue to get through the dungeon. Pick up another scroll. Ulurak Hysaok. Again, another unidentified scroll. But what we're looking for is a monster that can hurt us. Up here, what is this uh, red staircase up here? It is a hatch. A hatch is similar to a normal staircase, just if you go down, you cannot go back up again. You do not want to do that if you can avoid it at the moment. Because maybe you get into a bad situation through this hatch and you have no way to retreat. There's a scroll of corruption removal. 
not in this game, but something of that kind. For example, if we now got a scroll of enchant weapon or a scroll of enchant armor, they would be pretty much wasted because we will replace our armor and weapon as quickly as we find something better. That's the main reason. There are some very good scrolls, teleportation, blinking or so. We don't want to waste them. We want to have them when we need them. Here on the ground, that's a hand axe, but we already have a hand axe. So no need to care about that. A cobalt. Let's see if this cobalt can hurt us. The cobalt. Ouch, he hurt us. We say, oh no, we are hurt by the cobalt. What can we do now? We walk back to this position, for example. And here we have this little column of uh, squeeze squares. Once you have such a column, you can just walk around the column and regenerate your hit points until you're back at full, full HP and then reset the fight and fight again. On a Minotaur, that's not necessary. A Minotaur is so strong, he can easily kill this Cobalt. But if you play, play a tougher class, this um, so-called pillar dancing is a very important move in the early game. Also on street games, when you do not want to die by any means, pillar dancing can be, a, can be an essential strategy. We're still level one, but already halfway to level two. <laughs> On the first dungeon level, we will most likely not meet anything which is dangerous for us. Kiting for the win, Eldritch Wolfie, absolutely. Here comes another cobalt and he throws rocks at us. Let's throw some rocks back. F is the button to, uh, no, T is the button. No, was it F? Don't we, don't, don't we have the rocks? We have them. Uh, it should be F. Oh no, that was wrong. Why don't I have what what do you, no T for target also not? What was the button? I, I usually have a, a shortcut for melee fight for for ranged fighting. Hmm. We have to find that out. <laughs> uh, usually um uh, <coughs> embarrassing, embarrassing. Um Ah, okay, we've got the Berserk ability on our um, on our ability shortcut. That's the problem. We have to change that, but how did that work? Like, wait a second. Um, I don't know. S we want to cycle to, uh, to the rocks. Can we do that with uh, Shift Q? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Shift Q, you get to your quick quiver mode. And I had the Berserk ability and the quick quiver. That's why we berserk instead of throwing the rock. We don't want that. We want our thrown rocks in this quick uh, in this quick quiver. Now we can press F and enter and throw rocks at this goblin to soften him up a little bit before he reaches melee range. Didn't work perfectly fine now, but it's a chance to give you a small edge in these fights. This gray thing down here, that's an ordinary downstair. I'll show you how it works when, once we've scouted the whole level. What's this here on the ground? Let's quickly kill this goblin, then I'll explain these features on the ground to you. Pick up the rocks again. These blue things are teleportation traps. If we step on one of these traps, we get randomly teleported anywhere on the level. We don't know where. Could get us into a big mess. But it's also sometimes situationally helpful. If a very strong enemy follows you and you want to get rid of him, either you step into the trap yourself to get to another part of the level, or you lure the enemy into one of these traps, so the enemy will get teleported away. In the middle of these teleportation traps, there is an altar of Zom, the chaotic god I told you about. We do not want to follow Zom, we stay with Chalk. So let's quickly auto-explore the level. Here's another downstairs. Here's a bat, very weak enemy. Here we have a dart slug, and the dart slug did some damage. You saw we uh, took four points of damage from being hit by uh, the slug's attack. If you want more information about these enemies, you press Shift X, then you hover over the enemy and you press V. Shift X and V gets you to this menu. Here can we, we can read a little bit about the dart slug. I will, for example, I will show you uh, the text for the dart slug. A small invertebrate. It hunts prey considerably larger than itself by firing chitinous darts, using a concealed air bladder to launch them with remarkable range and power. Yeah, we just experienced that. It has an HP of roughly 10, armor class rather low, 
evasion rather low. We've got a 7% chance to miss it if we attack it in melee. No willpower, so easily uh, controllable. It looks easy. That's a rough estimation of the strength of the monster. It is susceptible to poison, so if we could poison it, it would be very, very effective. It is slow, so we can also outrun it. It is very small and can bite for three points of damage. And it has this special attack, Slug Dart, which does 2d4 points of damage. How do we keep this guy from uh, poking us from a distance? We just went one step down. So the slug dart, uh, the dart slug has to come close to us in order to um, get into line of sight again. We now just walk uh, diagonally up and we're in melee range. That's what we want against all ranged enemies. We want to get to melee range as quickly as possible. <coughs> a hobgoblin is a little bit stronger than a usual goblin, but you see this zzzz buttons upon his head. That means he hasn't realized us yet. We could now either retreat out of his line of sight in order to uh, avoid him and not having to fight him, or we could sneak towards him and try to get a backstabbing attack in. Both is possible. I will show you how the sneaking works, for, uh, the, the retreating works. We go one step back. We see now he's out of our line of sight. And if we did not want to fight this hobgoblin, we would now press shift X, shift X again hover over the goblin, but now we do not press V, we rather press E. E excludes all the squares which would give us line of sight on this goblin. So if we now auto explore, the character will never again go into a position where he gets into the line of sight of this goblin. Thus we could, if we don't make any noise, we could avoid him entirely. If we want to exclude just a single square, we press E one more time. Now there is still this exclusion, but it's just on the one square where the goblin is standing. This way you can, for example, block certain uh, corridors, which you don't want to go through. And if we press it one more time, the exclusion is gone. And that's what we want for our character, because we're a Minotaur Berserker. We kill the Hobgoblin. We will quickly rush through the level now. I think I explained most, most important things you need to know for the moment and for the first level. We are done. One thing that's always helpful if you're done with the level. You press Control F, the search mode, and then you just press dot. Dot and enter. That means you get shown all the items that are laying on this level. So everything that was dropped and all special features. A whip, a hand axe, a short sword, a club. Six teleportation traps, a shimmering altar of Zom, and a dispersal trap. The dispersal trap I didn't show you yet. I can quickly show that. A dispersal trap will not teleport you around the level. It will rather teleport you and every other monster in your line of sight to a random position within your line of sight. If I step into it, we get to this position, for example. We go in another time, we get down here. This might be very helpful if you want to kite an enemy and the enemy is as fast as you and you need to create distance to this enemy. You could very well abuse such a dispersal trap to create this distance. Well, dungeon level one done, let's go down to the next level. We could manually walk towards the stairs, we could also press shift X and then the usual downstairs command that is the same that you also use for Adam, so this, um, this arrow brackets. If you press it several times, it will go through all the different downstairs. We don't take the hatch, we rather go here to the closest down staircase. This little icon tells you that uh, you have never been down this staircase so far. You don't know where it ends. So let's go downstairs. Here we are on the second level. Nothing special to see so far. We also do not have any stack of two scrolls. As soon as we have a stack of two, we might start read IDing one of them. But we'll do that later. Let's just keep exploring, just like we did in the last round. We play that here clean. We retreat back out of the line of sight, make them follow us. And here we have the first very dangerous enemy. That's an adder. The problem with the adder is, I'll show you. At first, the adder is fast. All the downstairs lead to the same level. Indeed, they do. There are no parallel levels. 
All downstairs lead to the same level. First problem, the adder is fast and it even sw swims extremely quickly. That means you cannot outrun it on land and on water you cannot outrun it at all. It will definitely catch you if you're not a super fast character yourself. It can bite for five damage, but this bite also poisons you. And if you get multiple times poisons, the poison stacks, this can easily kill many early game characters. Very important to keep an eye open for these adders. With many characters, I would flee for a matter. Absolutely. With this character, we can fight it. I want the adder to follow us. It didn't see us yet. I don't want to go into the line of sight either. So what do I do? I throw a rock at the adder. Bam! The adder now is activated. It went to this square to stay out of our line of sight. So we retreat into the corridor. Here it comes. We go around the corner. It already bit us. That's not so good. But we are a Minotaur Berserker. This character is ab this enemy is absolutely worth using the Berserk ability. Now Berserking, we should be able to kill this adder pretty easily. Yeah, down it goes. We retreat to save territory so we can wait till the debuffs are gone and we continue scouting this level. So keep that in mind. Adders, very dangerous. Don't underestimate them. Frilled Lizard, that's also a very weak enemy. Ah, I moved towards the Frilled Lizard. And as I told you earlier, sometimes that's a bad decision because another enemy can just wait in the, in the fog of war outside the line of sight. And it is again an adder. I do not want to fight them both at once. So we retreat back into the corridor again. Now that we're here, we again use our Berserk ability and kill the adder as quickly as possible. And that was enough. We reached the second level. Excellent. We have the chance every three levels to increase either our strength or our intelligence or our dexterity. I would definitely go for strength. The reason is we want to be wearing really heavy armor later in the game. Afterwards, we killed this bad, uh, the lizard again. The fight is won. We are now level two. 33 base health. That was a big, big uh, pile of health that we just got. By the way, let's take a look at our skills. Fighting is now at 4.2 and X is at 4.8. We're getting closer to our goals. Yet another adder. This is Adder Kingdom. We woke up the adder by throwing a rock at it, retreated again into the corridor, and we berserk to fight it. By the way, if you want to fight quickly, tap is the button to quickly just keep attacking. With my settings, I can tap until my HP drops to 80% of the maximum. Let's try that. I will just quickly kill the adder. I just hit it quickly. We took a little bit of damage, but that's not too bad. If our HP dropped too, uh, too lowly, um, the tapping would have stopped. We got poisoned though, and you see now here, um, three different colors on our health bar. Red is the damage we took in the very last turn. Yellow is the expected damage that we will still take until the poison is gone. And green is the HP we have left after the poison is gone. So this poisoning is not lethal. We will survive it. But um, you can imagine what happens if your whole health bar is yellow. You know, damn, you have to do something or you will die. So let's retreat back to the stairs. Our bonus HP just uh, went away because uh, our Brother King went over. And this one adder made us drop down to one third of our max HP. That as a berserker. You see how dangerous these adders are. We stay on the stairs. So if an enemy comes around the corner, we can retreat back upstairs. And here we just play five, press five until we are fully regenerated. Yeah, that's the reason. You saw the first two adders were super easy. They just didn't hit us. We were lucky. But the third adder got its poisonous fangs right into our minotaur skin and took 66% of our HP. Take care of Adders. Uh, we retreat again. We play that safe and clean. Like I told you, with a Minotaur Berserker, that's not, ex not exactly necessary, but um, make the good habits. Make the good habits. You can always start playing fast once the good habits are uh, internalized. This Cobalt we just killed had an interesting item with it. Here, a scale mail. We pick up this scale mail. And now let's compare the scale mail to our current armor. 
The animal skin has a base armor rating of 2 and an encumbrance rating of 0. That means even a very weak character can use it without a penalty. It can be maximally enchanted to plus 2. That's a pretty crappy, crappy armor. Together with an unenchanted rope, that's pretty much the worst you can wear. The scale mail, on the other hand, has a base armor rating of 6, but also an encumbrance rating of 10. That means a rather weak character, a character will get a pretty massive uh, penalty to evasion when he wears this armor. Also spell casting will be a lot tougher in heavy armor. The only thing to counter this is to get strong enough. I don't know exactly how much it is, but from my experience, nah, don't know. At least as much strength as the encumbrance rating, I would say. Also, let's wear this armor by the way. You can train your armor skill to reduce this penalty even further. You can name your own gear, but Inscribe also has some practical functions. I use this very rarely, to be honest. But for example, if you are wearing two rings and you want to swap rings from time to time, you can inscribe one ring with the equal E, so you keep it equipped, equal capital E, and uh, you will automatically sw swap the other ring, so you don't have to uh, manually choose which ring you want to take off. Can be pretty handy, and there are other useful functions for inscribing too, but I never really got myself into that. That's, um, if, you, uh, if you know a lot about that, may will make your gameplay a, a bit more fluid. Well, maybe one time I have to, uh, have to deal with it. So, as you can see, we've, we are wearing a serious armor now. We don't need this animal skin anymore, so we uh, press D for drop, B for the animal skin, and we drop it to the ground. Armor class went up to 6. That already looks a lot better. We have a hunting sling on the ground here. We might pick that up. Yeah, let's do that. Why not? We play optimal. Now we have two weapons. The X has the letter A and the sling has the letter B. You can also change the letters if we want to. For example, if the sling had a bad number, we would press on the sling, press equal, and then we can adjust a new letter to it. Adjust which letter? Letter B. A and B are very important letters because by using, oh, I don't know the English word, um, by using this sign here, this sign on your keyboard, you can directly swap between the weapons, between A and B. So here, hand axe, hunting sling, hand axe, hunting sling. That's pretty handy. I will show you how that works in a second when we find another enemy. Ball python, not too dangerous. We have our hunting sling equipped now. So we can sling a rocket it, and afterwards quickly with this uh, letter that I just pressed in the chat, uh, swap back to the other weapon and kill it in melee. It's usually a good idea to have your ranged weapon as your standard weapon. Uh, as usually uh, you get a couple free attacks that way if the enemies don't appear right in front of you when you go around the corner. See, we killed this right from a distance. We hit it with the sling, perfect. Same with this goblin. Okay, again, I played that a bit below optimal. I just walked around the corner. Luckily, these enemies are not too dangerous. Later on in the game, we better avoid something like that. Here, a worm. I will show you the worm. He's very, very slow. That's important to, uh, to know. A very slow enemy. You can always outrun it. But the worm can bite you for up to 12 points of damage. There are characters who has, have l less than 12 HP in the early game. So take these guys seriously. If they hit you, they can bite out a whole chunk of flesh of your character. You don't want that to happen. Also the worm regenerates quickly, so it is hard to kite. We will probably not be able to kill it with our sling. Uh, the good thing is it is very slow. If the worm hits you, you get to low HP, you can always outrun it and retreat and probably pillar dance until you're back at full HP. It cannot do anything against that. So you should never ever die to a worm if you don't miss position and get uh, into a dead end. We want to kill this worm. Let's shoot it with our sling. Okay, okay, okay we can kill it with a sling. <laughs> 
Up here we have a potion. The potion is a gray potion. Q is the button to watch your potions. There you can drink it. Q, Q like quaff. It's not D like drink, but Q like quaff for the potions. But this potion is also still unknown. It could be something bad, like a potion of de degeneration or so. So we don't want to use that. R is the button for the, for the scrolls. By the way, we have now a stack of two. So soon we will identify our first scrolls. <laughs> scorpion. You see, the scorpion has got a, a red name here on the right side. Whenever you see a red name here, you know it's getting dangerous. Scorpion on dungeon level two is very dangerous. Scorpion is similar to an adder, but a lot stronger and a lot more poisonous. Let's take a look at the scorpion. It has pretty high EV, 44% chance to dodge our attacks. It has 18 HP, not too little. It can sting for 10 damage and massively poison us. It is extremely dangerous, as you can see here. We have to take this guy seriously. We want to fight him in a safe environment. So we retreat a couple of steps and go up here to the area that we have already secured. Now we shoot him a couple of times. One, two, three. We swap our weapons so we are on our main weapon the very moment he gets to melee range. And now we use our Berserk ability. Berserk is so strong, we should be able to just, bam, yeah, kill him. Minotaur Berserker finishes off the Scorpion. Many weaker combinations will struggle against this enemy. A D2 Scorpion? Aye, 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 that's dangerous. Here we have another hatch, but this hatch is not in the ground, it's rather in the, in the, in the, in the roof above us. R hatches upwards are very, very well taken. The reason is, at the very end of the game, when you retrieve the orb of sword from the bottom level, you want to go upstairs as quickly as possible. And probably that's a shortcut. So we want to know all upwards hatches, while the downwards hatches are not so interesting for us. So let's go upwards and directly back down because we scouted the upwards level already. Hi, Xeron69. You remember playing Dungeon Crawl Stone so many years ago? I guess this just upgraded an updated version. By the way, my friend recommended you when I started playing Adam again. Just finished watching Tiffany's Quest. Oh, Xaron! Oh, that's, that's uh, absolutely true. The versions changed a lot over the years. Funny fact, just yesterday I made a special challenge for myself. There was just one character class that I played back in the days but never won. And I always thought, oh, I won all the classes, but this character class, which is not even in the game anymore, since I think since, I don't know, seven versions or so, I have to um, make up for this unfinished business and finish this character class. So just yesterday, I played on the very old version, on the 0.15 version of the game, a Minotaur healer and got my first ever healer win on this very, very old version. <laughs> And that was really interesting to see how differently the game played back in these days. <laughs> also, please say thanks to your friend who recommended my channel. I'm really glad you liked it. <laughs> Hi, I am Bergie. <laughs> Welcome to the channel. And thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was unfinished business. I had to take care of that at one point. <laughs> That was so funny because um, it took me several years to get my first crawl win. And um, although I played this uh, healer back in 0.15, I got my first win just in 0.18. I never ever won a game in 0.15. First time just yesterday. I just did an ordinary three rune victory. I, don't, I, I didn't want to uh, do anything fancy. I just wanted to get that out of my mind. <laughs> That's also why I played the Minotaur, because um, Minotaurs are strong. <laughs> By the way, just to mention that I am on a two games winning streak. I won an Ogre Delver the, day, uh, uh, the other day, I won this Minotaur yesterday, so we are on a winning streak. We don't want to lose this tutorial game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, we're back down on D2, we continue. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Take a look at that. We just... Uh, got three enemies in our line of sight at the same time. A cobalt with a spear, an adder 
and a dart slug. All of them together, pretty dangerous. We don't want that to happen. But you see this little question mark in the corner above the dart slug. The question mark means it is already active, but it hasn't seen us yet. It will randomly walk through the level, but if we get out of its line of sight, it will not directly follow us. Let's try to keep it like that. We go one step to the north. The others saw us, so they will follow us, but the dart slug will not follow. So we change to this position up here. One step back, swap to our X, Berserk down the adder and the other guy, and the dart slug did not take place, uh, take part in this fight. Very nice. These are the decisions you should make in the early game. Try to choose where you fight and whom you fight and when you fight. That's the most important thing for early game survival. Do not just rush into the, every enemy you see. You will just get yourself into a bad situation. Maybe it works 9 out of 10 times, but the 10th time you will say, oh damn, I wish I hadn't done that. Tried and never managed in Adom. Oh yeah, I always wanted to do the Rocky Balboa challenge, like a hearthling farmer who wins the game using no other weapons but thrown rocks. And I think I never ever won a Chaos Knight. I tried that several times too. I always mess, uh, they start with so high protection value that I always play uncareful and, and mess them up for some stupid reason. So uh, all the Chaos Knight endings still completely open to me. These are two uh, tried and never managed uh, things in Adom that I definitely have to take, up, ca take care of. But before I do challenges in Adom, I at first have to get the rust from my skills and get to the point where I can win more or less, less reliably again. So uh, probably not this run or the next run. If, I, if I've got one or two wins under my belt again, then I will think about the Adom challenges again. I have to say that um, in direct comparison, I am not as good in Adom as I am in Crawl. It's just from the pure numbers, I won 30 Adom games, I think, and I won 260 Crawl games. That's a bit of a difference. So um, all these super tough challenges. I think the toughest challenges I did in Adom was the Iron Man challenge, where I won the game pretty much I directly headed towards the caverns of chaos and left them just once for the Tower of Eternal Flames. Apart from that, I just stayed in the caverns of chaos. That was a pretty challenging thing I did in Adom. I did some kind of a speed run below 40,000 turns once, but that's not so speed runny compared to the really good speed run players. And ultra ending, that's probably, probably the more challenging things I did in Adom. Also streaking wins. Uh, but um, yeah, in Adam, I never streaked more than two games. I can still improve on that, and I want to. <laughs> I hope we will get that done during this year, probably. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're still on dungeon level two. I told you that this is a quick game. Usually, you play that a lot quicker than I do it now. It's just that I want to explain as much as possible, and uh... ha! The game is really tough to us. See that? That's a null pack. We see two nulls. Two nulls indicate there is at least one more. I think it is a null pack. And one of these nulls has a halberd. A halberd is a very dangerous weapon. It's a pretty high damage two-handed weapon. A halberd null for most characters in the early game is a reason to run and never come back to this level again. Luckily, we play a Minotaur Berserker. So what do we do? We retreat out of the line of sight of these guys, swap to our X, and now uh, wait one more turn. The problem is, like I told you, pole arms, like the spear or the halberd, have increased range, so this guy can hit us from his position. The halberd null cannot. So we have to fight our way through to him as quickly as possible. How do we do that? With our shortcut, we berserk. Berserk down the snail. Berserk the first null, berserk the second null, and retreat before potential other nulls see that we are here. The reason for the retreat is uh, we make some noise fighting in this Berserk node. And uh, if other enemies in the area hear us, they will come to the source of the noise. So I do not want to be there when they arrive. How about Spear? Nope, we are an X-Wheeler. We will stay an X-Wheeler. And here's the third null. I told you there was at least one more in the pack. 
just an ordinary null, we can just melee him. I will play the rest of the level a bit quicker and just slow down when uh, specific challenges appear. Get another potion. That's a spell book, but uh, since Chok uh, doesn't like us casting spells, we will never use spell books. We just leave it on the ground. And we're done with the second level. Let's quickly check what we found here. Nothing interesting. The ring mail is uh, one tier worse than our scale mail. The weapons we don't need, everything fine. Let's go down to the third level. But before we start uh, exploring this third level, I told you we've got a stack of two scrolls. There is a decent chance that a two scroll stack is an identify scroll and that's what we want to find. So we read this two scroll stack. Nah, it's not identify. It's a scroll of fog. A very tactical item. You use it either to block the line of sight to enemies, because as you can see outside of this fog we cannot see anything anymore. Or you can also use it uh, in order to um, create a fog and thus prevent the enemies from using cloud attacks. Because there can just be one cloud on a square at, one, uh, at, at the same time. And finally you can also, that's a pretty advanced trick, you can use it uh, to get teleported from a dispersal trap into the direction where you want to go. But that's very advanced, you don't need that yet. <laughs> Just remi remember, if you need to block line of sight, scroll of fog is your way to go. We will quickly go through here and ah, that's excellent. See, that's a hat. It's not a magical hat though. We have to kill this dark slot, did some damage, so we retreat to block line of sight. Always what you want to do, block line of sight against uh, ranged enemies. We pick up the hat, it's a plus zero hat. At the moment, it will not change our defensive stats at all. But probably we will get a chance to enchant this head. You can enchant it maximal, uh, at a maximum of two times. And a plus two head, that's two additional points of armor class. Again, you will see I go around these corners to play this safe. Not attract unnecessary enemies. Orc wizard. Orc wizards usually don't come along. They come with a whole orc pack. And the Orc Wizard has a couple strong spells. He can get invisible, which is pretty dangerous. He can throw flames at us for a maximum of 15 points of fire damage. That's a lot. But the range of throw flames is just seven. So I think we are still out of his range. He can magic dart, 3d4, but uh, you cannot resist this damage. And he can confuse us. And since we have such low willpower, he has a 49% chance of confusing us. When we're confused, we cannot move controlled anymore. It's the same as confusion in Adam. What can we do now? As you can see, we have by now, due to killing a couple of enemies, not one, but two pits of piety. That means we have now got our second truck ability, which is truck's hand. Truck's hand takes a lot of piety. It takes quite a lot. It will probably get us back, back down to one pit. But it has uh, two big advantages. First, it greatly increases our natural HP regeneration. Second, it gives us two free pits of magic resistance or willpower as it is now called. So if we want to fight these orcs, we want to use willpower. We will not fight them here though. I would like to kill the wizard without the rest of the orcs following him. So here we are, here comes the orc wizard. We apply our truck sand ability and you see willpower plus plus. Now with Truck Sand active, the chance went down to 2%. Now I'm not afraid of this guy anymore. Still I want to kill him quickly, so we also Berserk. Bam bam bam, he goes down. Perfect. Orc Wizards, very dangerous early game enemy. Remember from what we met so far? Orc Wizards, Adders, Scorpions, that was out of depth, that was ridiculous, and Helbert Nalls. These four can kill you on the first dungeon levels, definitely. Keep that in mind. Whenever you see one of them, slow down your gameplay and carefully think how and uh, by which means he wants to fight them. Here is the rest of the Orc pack, at least one of them. There comes the next one. We can kill them one at a time. Another Orc wizard. What do we do? Truck sand. We don't want him to confuse us. Over here there was an ant. I will show you the ant if you can find it. Here is the ant. 
The Ant is pretty much an upgraded vision of the Adder, version of the Adder. It can also poison you, it's also fast, but it has more HP and a little more damage than it does. So we kill the Ant just the same way we killed the Adder. Berserk. Oh, and see that whenever we Berserk and we get out of the Berserk mode, there is a certain small chance that we will not just get the minus Berserk debuff and the slow debuff, but we will get even paralyzed. Paralyzed means our evasion goes pretty much to zero, our shield skill goes to zero, and we cannot move for a lot of turns. How long does that take? We are now at 2932. We are now at 2933. For 10 turns, we have not been able to move. If that happens while in the middle of a couple strong enemies, you're dead. So although Berserk is a strong ability, use it with care. You do not want to be paralyzed in the middle of strong enemies. Make sure that you can kill the enemies when you go to Berserk. We will quickly scout the rest of this level. Orc pack. The Orc pack does not seem to have a magic user, but there might be someone around, so we go around the corner. And you probably already saw that this this uh, whip the Orc was wielding looked a little strange. The reason? This is a whip of holy wrath, a magical weapon. We pick that up. A Whip of Holy Wrath gives us massive bonus damage against Undead. And since we are training Axes, we automatically cross-train, just with half the amount of experience, pole arms and maces and flails. A Whip is a maces of flail and flails weapon, so we can absolutely use that if we have to fight an Undead. Also, I want to pick up these boomerangs. Boomerangs are pretty strong, strong thrown weapon. Silver boomerangs, even additional de uh, demon and under damage. We might use them later. Again, an adder. We berserk against the adder. We don't want to get poisoned. Hobgoblin, no problem. We reached level 6. Getting our next stat increase, let's put it into strength again. Again, an adder. Berserk, kill it, retreat. And we're done with the third level. We played the levels a little quicker now. We don't uh, need to uh, play everything super slowly. We just wait. Uh, see here, there's a centaur skeleton. We can probably kill it quicker with the Holy Wrath Whip. Bam! Extra damage. That hurt centaur, didn't it? Back to our X now. I will... Um... By the way, I press W for the weapon menu to change my weapon. I will just slow down the game if there are, are certain especially challenging situations. Now, apart from that, let's apply what we just learned and go through these levels rather quickly. This is a bit of an undead level. Okay, here comes another end. I positioned that not perfectly. We are in a rather suboptimal situation. Also, we got paralyzed again. But here on the ground, this axe, it has this uh, blue piece at the bottom. This is a hand axe of flaming. Excellent item drop. Excellent, truly excellent. First, flaming gives uh, the character a, gives a pretty high on hit damage, bo uh, bonus damage. That is uh, a significant amount. This is uh, much more damage we do. Second, we have a plus one enchantment on this weapon. That means plus one to hit, plus one damage on addition to the flaming. Third, flaming is a very important trait on Axis. Because at one point in the mid game, you absolutely have to fight Hydras. You do not get around fighting Hydras if you don't want to outrun them all. And if you attack a Hydra with an axe, you just chop off one head, but another additional head grows. The Hydra gets stronger and stronger to the point where it gets really, really dangerous to you. The only option you have with an axe is using a flaming axe, because the flame of this axe directly closes the wound, so you can just chop off the heads and no new heads grow. A flaming axe, even if it's just a hand axe, is amazing to have. That means that, um, that uh, Hydras will not be a problem. The flaming axe has now the shortcut X, which kind of fits, but we don't like it. We want the quick swap command, so we press equal and we adjust it to the letter A. 
Now we can swap quickly between the Hunting Sling and the Flaming Axe. That was an excellent item drop. See what just happened. We took a lot of damage. Why did that happen? Bjork smites you. I played too quickly. What happened here? We have an Orc Wizard in this Orc pack, but this green Orc, this is the truly dangerous one. This is an Orc Priest. The Orc Priest has the special abilities. Cantrip, I don't exactly know what that does. Casts one of the most small major spells aimed at uh, trying to bolster the caster's moral. They have no noticeable effect. Yep, I, I don't exactly know what Cantrip does. Pain is a damage spell. Ha, there's a significant amounts of damage in exchange for a minor backlash. He can heal other orcs. And he can also cast Smite. And Smiting is a damage spell that cannot miss and he can plus you, you cannot hide from it. As long as the enemy is in line, line of sight, he can smite you. That's really dangerous. We have a bad position to fight these guys, so we retreat into the corridor instantly. Now the Orc Priest comes into view, so theoretically he could now smite us. Luckily he doesn't do it, not yet. We go around the corner and here we are Berserk. Now that we are on this side of the corner, we can quickly get towards the magic users and kill them. An Orc pack with a wizard and a priest. Extremely serious threat. Never underestimate them. It's an altar of Dithminus, the god of shadows. We don't need that. We have another Null pack. Usually I should retreat. We're a berserker. I go into the middle. Aye, aye, aye. You see, it was a mistake. I went into the middle. They hit us. Did a lot of damage. We have to kill them quickly, starting with the guy with the flail, continuing with the others. The guy with the morning star probably does even more damage, this orc, so we run towards him and attack him. Because I want the morning star guy to die before we run out of berserk. The reason why I now rush in is because we are already pretty low HP and I don't want to run out of, uh, of the berserk uh, rage while there are still strong enemies around. Kill them all. Let's try to retreat. Oh, that's not good. See, now we are slowed. We've got the minus berserk trait. There's a fast frog zombie close to us. Here comes a fast ant zombie. And here's an orc priest. If at that p moment we got paralyzed and we were unlucky, the frog and the priest together could have killed us. That was a misplay by me. That was a potential situation. If you do that too often, you just die. Yeah. So, what do we... Uh... Hi, Schenger! <laughs> Welcome to the stream! So, what do we do now? We'll retreat to this hatch. And we'll try to retreat up to the next level, which is already cleared. We go to bottom right, so we leave the line of sight of the priest. Go top right now. One more step. Okay, okay. And the orc blocked this gas. We are in a bit of trouble now. What do we want to do to get out of here? At first, we need some regeneration. We use truck sand. Oh my god, we might actually die. <laughs> we might actually die here. Um, yeah, it brought us into a really bad situation. This is the point in the game where you want to slow down and see what you can do. What do we have? We have an amulet of guardian spirit. Should have equipped that earlier. We have three big stacks of scrolls. These stacks could be, could be uh, exactly what we're looking for. Because chances are pretty high. One of the pretty um, common scrolls is teleportation. If we get a scroll of teleportation, we will teleport out of this situation. That would probably be the best thing. We might also get Identify, one of them is Surely Identify, which would at least um, get us knowledge of uh, a different uh, bigger stack. We have a couple of bigger stacks of potions that we might try if we get in trouble, but my uh, chance to getting a bad one is pretty high. I think our best option at the moment is to read the big scrolls piles that we have. Identify would help, teleportation would help, blinking would help, fear would help. Let's try that. Read this stack. It is a scroll of identify. Aha. What do we want to identify? Scroll or potion? 
Mm. I think it might be a good idea to identify potions first. Because potions, yeah, let's do that. Oh my god, we got a little damage again. What was the potion that we got? It's a potion of flight. That doesn't help us at all. Let's read the next scroll. This one. Enchant armor. Doesn't really help us either. We take a little more damage. Luckily we regenerate very quickly at the moment. Problem is we are still slowed. All the actions take 1.5 rather than 1. That's why you have to be careful with your berserk. I did that in a bad situation. RNG decided to throw everything at us. So now we have to uh, take care to get out of here. Um, fuck, identify enchant armor. Let's read this one. What was it? It was magic mapping. Doesn't really help us either. Uh, we could bet on the last scrolls or we could identify another potion. Let's bet on the scrolls first. Okay, and that was it. Oh, that was bad luck. Do you know what we just did? <laughs> we read a scroll of immolation. The scroll of immolation puts this debuff on all the enemies around us. When the enemies die while being emulated, when the enemy, em, enemies die while being emulated, they explode in a flaming eruption. At the very same turn we did that, our haunt auxiliary attack killed an enemy, so the enemy exploded and we, we died by our own explosion. Ay ay ay, that was painful. So guys, <laughs> on the other hand, I think that was an excellent lesson. That's actually a bit embarrassing for me to die on a Minotaur Berserker. That's usually a totally safe win class. But uh, what's the lessons you can take from, from this death? First, be very careful with your Berserk. I Berserked, I, I, I thought I was safe on D4 with a Minotaur Berserker and a good X. So I just run into the enemy. I berserked. Very many enemies came from up here. I was in a bad situation. Slowed. And already hurt quite heavily. Then I didn't use the amulet. Although we had it. Another mistake. Also I didn't read the double stack scrolls when I had the chance. Another mistake. So at this point you might say oh that was really bad luck, you got the emulation scroll and at the very same turn your, your, your horns killed the monster and you blew yourself up. But on the other hand there was no need to get into the situation. It was just me thinking that I played a little too slowly, it was getting boring and I had to rush it a little bit. That's what uh, streak playing in Adom is actually about. It's uh, absolutely about avoiding these kinds of situation. Even uh, how are the odds of that happening? Probably uh, very, very low. But um, in a street game, you don't want to take the 95% chance. Because 95% chance still means, means that once out of 20 games, you will not survive it. Yeah, cancellation would have worked. Blinking would have worked. Fear would have worked. Teleportation would have worked. And many others would have just have not done anything. But uh, I, emulation... At the very same moment where we killed the enemy with our auxiliary attack, that was really very, very bad luck. But, well, don't gamble on not having bad luck. The golden rule of roguelikes is usually uh, don't depend on luck. If you depend on luck, you will eventually die. You will probably win a game or two, but at least in the third game you will die. Anyways, um... Do you have any questions up to this point? Was all the explanation, was it more or less understandable or... Uh... Xeron, you had a level 18 beast fighter in Adam. Defending his arena title. The first monster was a diamond golem. Random risks, not usually worth it, yeah. That's why I never do the uh, defense fights if I do not have control teleportation available. I only, I always do that when I can doubt teleport out. There is no more food in this game, Eldritch Wolfie. There used to be food, thousand different food items. They were removed just two versions ago. 
The last tournament was the first, first tournament without food. I think one reason is that for melee characters, food never really mattered. You swim in perma food items at the end of the game as a melee character. It was pretty important for casters though, because there was a hunger cost uh, for casting spells. So since that's not the case anymore, playing casters became a lot more comfortable. Can potions be used offensively? Absolutely. I uh, like to use this very scroll, Immolation, in combination with high fire resistance to blow up armies of enemies at once. That's such a satisfying feeling. Also, there are many offensive potions like Potion of Haste, Potion of Might, Potion of Berserk Rage. So yeah, potions can absolutely be used offensively, be it to buff yourself or also to do damage like with this emulation scroll. There are cursed item on the last stable version. On this trunk version that we just played, they have removed the cursed feature from the game. I'm not sure if I like it or not. I'm not yet sure if I like this change or if I don't like it. So until the last tournament, there were still cursed items. In this version, no cursed items anymore. <clears throat> I think the direction the game takes is clear. They want to make it a little more streamlined. They want to... Uh, uh, they want to uh, um, reduce the grinding and the uh, unnecessary features that don't play a role in many in many runs. I'm not sure if that was the was the case for Curse though. That was a risk. You knew you took a risk if you pick up an item that could be cursed, and uh, it was an interesting risk reward situation. I have to find out how that works now. Robotskis, I would recommend the server that is closest to your place. There are servers in the US, in Australia, in uh, there is a French server, there is a German server, there are servers uh, further to the east. Take the one that is closest to your place. I have an account on every single server because I know uh, crawl players from all around the world and sometimes I'd like to spectate their games. Because take a look at this here. Down here in the bottom, I didn't show you that. One of the main reasons why I like playing on the server. That's me. That's Beam the bot. But uh, Shenga, could you quickly come into the the um, into the spectator mode to show to show to the guys? It is possible to spectate other players' games and chat with them down in the chat here. Which is pretty amazing. That was my idea with this tutorial run. That uh, once I reach the temple, you guys try it. And if you get into trouble, I can spectate your games and uh, see if I uh, maybe can help you to find a solution. Uh, what is your favorite race class combination? I that's a question. Um, depends. Depends. Um, I am actually pretty solid with the very strong races. I am greater Minotaur and greater Hill Orc. That means that I won all classes with Minotaur and Hill Orc. But it's not the most fun to play. Ha! Take a look here. Suddenly we have a spectator. Disco Bob. That's Schenger24 on the chat. And now, if, 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 if you want, you can click on his name, so you will get to his uh, place. And you can see he has got, already got a couple of wins under his belt. His last win was a Minotaur fighter on this account. He can now chat with me here on the, on the, on the, in the spectator chat. And that's super helpful. It's totally interesting. Just to, Sometimes I just uh, take a look at uh, games of my friends and see how they handle certain situations. If you get in trouble in your game, you can ask a friend for help. He can come uh, in your game and spectate and uh, find a solution together with you. It's a super nice feature, if you ask me. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Schenger. <laughs> yeah, so uh, favorite race and class. Hmm. Um, 
when it comes to casters, I love Ice Elementalists. That's uh, by far the caster class I, I prefer playing. Um, when it comes to melee characters, yeah, good question. Um, actually, in the whole last tournament, I almost didn't play a single real melee class because um, I tried to get a good winning streak. So I uh, played the strong uh, melee races with uh, weak caster classes. And that made for a special challenge at the beginning of the game. But uh, I get a win with a weak class pretty easily. I wanted to keep the strong classes for the weaker races, uh, but for some stupid reason, I messed up both my streak attempts on super strong combos, which was uh, not exactly what I planned. So in the end, I ended with my best streak being just seven games. That was less than I wanted to get. <laughs> At the beginning of the video of this video, maybe you can see it in the VOD, uh, uh, Cos Bandito, I uh, made some recommendations which races and classes to start with that might be interesting for you. So, um, apart from that, I hope you had a little fun with me embarrassing myself and messing up the Minotaur Berserker. <laughs> I think, uh, despite this uh, disgraceful ending, we put a couple of pretty helpful information into uh, this little tutorial screen. And well, um, if you enjoyed it, let me know. Uh, we, we could do something like that again in the future. Now that I explained the very basics, I will also uplo upload that on YouTube so everybody has the chance to see it. And next time we can play the beginning a bit faster and get to, to, the, to the late early game, which would also be pretty interesting. There are certain new challenges that, that would be fun facing and, uh, and uh, talking about the solutions. So step by step, I'm pretty sure uh, if you're interested, you will get your first win in this game hmm, rather soon maybe. <laughs> Ah, glad to hear that you liked it. I would definitely keep that in mind. And at one point, when uh, uh, when you're in for it, we'll make another tutorial scream and I will not die with the Minotaur, tor Minotaur Berserker. <laughs> Anyways, thanks a lot to all of you who tuned in. Thanks to everybody on the stream. Also, thanks to everybody who will watch this on YouTube. I will probably upload it tomorrow. Um, the next stream on my plan will take place on Sunday, 5 p.m. Central European time. And this will again be an Adom stream, an extended Adom stream with our new Dwarvish character. And hopefully he will not have the same success as our Minotaur had today. Until then, bye everybody. <laughs>